So what I'd love to do is to share that research with you today because it's transformed not only my life, but I think having watched you over the past two days, I think we can create a movement that's starting here. And that I'm so excited about. But in order to do that, we need to, we need to go deep into this research. And I want to start where I started with this research. And I started doing this research when I was just seven years old. So if any of you have children and they're seven and they're not doing academic research, you're clearly not pushing them hard enough. <laughs> when I was seven and my sister was five years old, we were playing up on top of a bunk bed. How many of you have bunk beds, had bunk beds? Lot of you. I love them. I would still have them now if they were socially acceptable. <laughs> but on one side, my sister was two years younger than me at the time, and she's, she's two years younger than me now. But at the time, <laughs> that meant she had to do everything I wanted to do, and I wanted to play war. So on one side of the bunk bed, I had all of my G.I. Joe soldiers and weaponry lined up. And on her side, she had all of her My Little Ponies and unicorns ready for this cavalry charge. And I wasn't concerned about what would happen because I had won this war every time we had played in the past. And there are differing accounts of what happened that afternoon, but since my sister was not invited to Tampa, you get to hear the true story. <laughs> Which is my sister is a little bit on the clumsy side. And somehow, without any help or push, from her loving older brother at all, suddenly Amy disappeared off of the top of the bunk bed and landed with this crash on the floor. And I nervously peered over the side of the bed to see what had befallen my fallen sister and saw that she landed painfully on her hands and knees on all fours on the ground. Now I was nervous because my parents had charged me with making sure that my sister and I played as safely and as quietly as possible. And seeing as how I'd accidentally broken Amy's arm, just one week before. <laughs> don't take her side, you don't even know her. <laughs> I was heroically trying to push her out of the way of an oncoming imaginary sniper bullet from Cobra Commander, <laughs> for which I have yet to be thanked. She didn't even see it coming, and I was trying as hard as I could to be on my best behavior. And I saw my sister's face this wail of pain and suffering and surprise, threatening to erupt from her mouth and threatening to wake my parents from the long winter's nap for which they had settled. So I did the only thing that my little frantic seven-year-old brain could think to do to avert this tragedy. And if you have children, you've seen this hundreds of times before. I said, Amy, Amy, wait, please, please don't cry. Did you see how you landed? No human lands on all fours like that. <laughs> she stopped mid-cry with confusion on her face and looked up, and I have no idea where this is going. That was the extent of my strategy. So I blurted out the only thing my brain could think of, which is, Amy, I think you're a unicorn. <laughs> which was cheating, because there's nothing in the world Amy would want more at that moment to not be Amy, the hurt five-year-old little sister, but Amy, the special unicorn. Of course, an option that was open to her brain at no point in the past. And you could see on my poor, manipulated sister's face conflict as her brain attempted to devote resources to feeling the pain and suffering and surprise she'd experienced falling off this bunk bed or contemplating this newfound identity as a unicorn. <laughs> and the latter one out, instead of crying, instead of ceasing our play, instead of waking my parents from the long winter's nap that they were, they would settle for, instead a smile spread across her face and she bound right back up onto the bunk bed with all the grace of a baby unicorn with one broken leg. What we had stumbled across at that tender age of five and seven, we had no idea at the time was something that was going to be at the vanguard of a scientific revolution occurring two decades later in the way that we understand the human brain. What we learned is that the human brain is like a single processor in a computer. We have a limited amount of resources to experience the world, which means that if our brain, as we're scanning and look at the world, our brain can process 40 bits of information per second, which is so fast, but we receive 11 million pieces of information every second from our nerve endings, which means our reality, we're picking and choosing constantly, which means scientifically, happiness is actually a choice. It's a choice about how our brain decides to look at the world. 
If we scan the world for the negatives, the hassles, and the complaints first, then maybe you know people that are like that. They can walk into any room and they can find the thing to complain about immediately. Those people are not bad people. Their brains are experts at scanning the world for the negatives and hassles first. The problem is our brains are limited. What we scan for first becomes our reality. What we found is we literally have no brain left over to scan the world for the, the things that make us grateful in the present moment, the meaning embedded in our lives, and the ways of transforming this present reality into a better reality. What we've stumbled across is a new field called positive psychology, which changes the way we look at human beings. And what we discovered is not only can we raise people's levels of happiness, but in doing so, we can improve your health outcomes, your business outcomes, your educational outcomes for your children. It turns out the human brain has an incredible advantage of positive if we can choose how to do that. What I'd like to talk about is how we do that. So here's what I'd like to start with. When I first got into this, they said, if you're gonna start doing this research and spreading this out to people, whatever you do, don't start your talks with a lot of graphs or data or research. But where I'd like to start today, I'd like to start with a graph. <laughs> this graph looks boring. This graph is the reason that I get excited and wake up every morning, which means I live a very, very exciting life. <laughs> Each of these dots represents an individual. I could be plotting anything here. Now, if I was studying you, which I would love to do, I would love to find out, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'll tell you about that one. If, I, this is the data, if this is the data I got back studying you, I would be thrilled as a researcher, because look, there's very clearly a trend that's going on there in the data, and that means that I can get published, which is all that matters. <laughs> the fact that there's one weird red dot that's up above the curve, there's one weirdo in this room. You know who you are. Everyone knows who you are. We know who you are. <laughs> that's no problem. That's no problem because we can just delete you. We can delete you because you <laughs> are clearly a measurement error. And I know that you're an error because you're messing up my data. <laughs> so one of the very first things we teach people in economics and statistics and business and government courses is how, in a valid way, can we eliminate the weirdo from our data? Because what I'm interested in is the average. I want to find out how many aspirin or Advil the average person should take. But what I'm fascinated by is this. That's great if I'm asking questions like that, but as soon as we start asking questions as humans about potential, about intelligence, about creativity, about energy levels, about health, we're asking questions about potential. And what we found is if we start doing science like this, we create what I call the cult of the average, which many of you might have seen in your lives. What, you see, what we see is that if we ask a question like, how fast can a child learn how to read in a classroom? Scientists change the answer to, here's how fast the average child learns how to read in that classroom. And we tailor the class right towards the average, forgetting the fact that many of us read much slower than the average, or much faster than the average. Now, if you fall below average at a company, then psychologists get thrilled, because that means you're either depressed, or you have a disorder, or hopefully both. <laughs> We're hoping for both because we have a different business model than you. Our business model is if you come into a therapy session with one problem, we want to make sure you leave knowing you've got 10 problems. <laughs> we'll go all the way back into your childhood to prove this to you, but eventually the role of traditional psychology is how do we make you normal? But normal is merely average. And what I posit and what positive psychology found is that if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average in our companies, in our schools, worldwide. Instead of deleting these outliers, which is you, everyone in this room is an outlier for something. You're above the curve for your courage, for your intelligence, for your creativity, for your energy, your musical ability, your athletic ability, whatever it is that causes you to be an outlier, don't let us delete you. Let us learn from you about how we can move people not up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up in this world. Well, that's, cool. that's where I get excited. Woo! And that, I believe, is exactly what you're doing. And the reason that I want to share this, and the reason I felt that there is this natural synergy with It Works, is because when I turn on the news, 
you've heard this before, it's, it's about murder and corruption and diseases and natural disasters. And very quickly, your brain starts to think, okay, Sean, that's the, that's the, that's the real, av real ratio. There's a lot more negative to all the few positive things that are going on in our world. That changes us. It creates what we call the medical school syndrome. During the first year of medical training, as, as these brilliant doctors read through all the symptoms and diseases that could happen to a human being, many of these brilliant doctors start thinking that they have all of those symptoms and diseases. They actually start manifesting it. I have a brother-in-law named Bobo, which is a whole other story how that happens. <laughs> Bobo married Amy the Unicorn, which makes sense, and became a pediatrician. But Bobo called me on the phone from Yale Medical School, our rival, and he said, Sean, I have, I have leprosy, which even at Yale is extraordinarily rare. But I had no idea how to console poor Bobo because he had just gotten over an entire week of menopause. <laughs> See, what we're finding is it's not necessarily the reality that shapes us. It's the lens through which we view the world that shapes how we experience reality. What I'd love to do is to do a brief experiment with you. This, I think, is the, physics, the biggest experiment I've done all in one time. So I'm so excited to see how this works. So thank you for inviting me to do this. I, I, I can't help myself, but here's what I'd love for you to do. You don't have to do my experiment. I'm not allowed to bring consent forms to talks anymore after the electric shock problem a couple times ago. But if you're willing to participate, all I need you to do is just to partner up with someone who's sitting next to you. Partner up into pairs of two. Before you do that, I'm legally required, at least in the United States, to tell you that you cannot partner up with someone that you're married to or someone that you want to be married to, so move around if you need to. Partner up with somebody sitting next to you very quickly in the pairs of two, of course pairs of two, in the pairs. Does everyone have a partner of non-marriageable material? Okay, here's what I'd like you to do. The person that's sitting closest to me right now, your person number one in the pair. For those, you can just pick down the road who you want to be. Whoever seems closest to me, your person number one. The other person, there's person number two. There should be a one and a two in each group. Raise your hand if you're person number one. Raise your hand if you're person number two. That is not the experiment, so don't get excited. <laughs> But I have to do that now because I did this experiment on Wall Street with these bankers and it literally took them five minutes to figure out who number one in the group was. Which explains what's going on there. So here's what I'd love for you to do. How many of you have a psychology background? You love psychology books? You've studied psychology? Raise your hand. So for my psychology friends, this is the emotional prime of the experiment. For everyone else, this is nothing. Over the course of your life, you've taken your genetic predispositions, your genes, and you've built those up through your self-discipline and your self-control. You were able to pass the classes you needed to in school, to apply yourselves to your family lives, and to be part of this. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have incredible self-discipline and control and willpower. What I'd love for you to do is to use all of that that you've been cultivating since you started crawling, and I'd like you to use that to control your behavior with your partner for seven seconds of this experiment. Person number one, what we ask you to do is to not get angry with person number two when they do to you what I'm about to tell them to do to you. <laughs> person number one, don't get angry. Don't get sad. Please, please don't cry like the group last week. This is, should be so benign. In fact, person number one, what I'd like you to do is just to do nothing with your partner. So person number one and two, please turn and face one another. Person number one, make sure you're within striking distance of person number two. And person number one, go neutral on the inside. Try to feel no emotions and try and think no thoughts, which for some of you is gonna be much easier than others. Then what I'd like you to do is just control your behavior, person number one, control your thoughts, Try and have no thoughts. Try and control your emotions. Don't move your hands, person number one, to defend yourself. And don't show any emotion on your face. No fear, no flinching, no frustration, nothing. Once you're using your decades of self-discipline and control to control yourself, person number one, then person number two, please look at them. Make sure you're looking at them directly in the eyes. And for the next seven seconds, person number two, 
please smile genuinely and warmly directly up into the eyes of person number one. <laughs> Go. <laughs> and stop. Is that hard? Yeah. <laughs> My eyes are like. We're gonna need to do like, that one more time. I didn't realize when I paired you up, the person number one was gonna be that bad at it. Person number two, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were the one with all the power and control in this relationship. Let's switch it around. Now my psychology friends, you know we're not supposed to do this. The deception's gone, so now we've got nothing. Let's just try it. Person number two, go neutral on the inside. Feel no emotions, think no thoughts, and control your face for seven seconds. Person number one, please look at them. Make sure you're looking at them directly in the eyes. And for the next seven seconds, it's your turn for retaliation. Go. I don't know why you're clapping because this group failed miserably in that experiment. <laughs> Which I'm thrilled to see. We don't have time to count you because you're way too big. But let me tell you what happens in normal rooms which this clearly isn't. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens. On average, 80 to 85% of people worldwide cannot control themselves for the seven seconds of this experiment. You guys look way worse than that. <laughs> but here's what we found. The reason this experiment works so well is that you're having to fight against your own brain not to smile because your brain actually tells you you're the one that's smiling. What we found inside the human brain by accident is if you put me into an fMRI brain scan and scan my brain while I'm smiling, small parts of my brain will show activation. Basically saying, Sean, you're smiling, which we knew would happen. But if I stop smiling, but you keep scanning me, it turns out if somebody walks by and smiles at me, small little parts of my brain called mirror neurons will light up. And when these mirror neurons light up, they say, Sean, you're smiling. But I'm not smiling, you're smiling. But before I can stop myself, my brain drops a chemical, as you know, called dopamine into the system, raising my levels of happiness and enjoyment, and very quickly, my motor neurons move my face into a smile before I can stop myself. You've seen this happen before. If you've ever spoken to a group of people and one person starts to yawn and then other people start to yawn, that's not because you're boring. That can't possibly be it, I keep saying. What's happening there is, is as I see somebody yawn my visual, in my visual field, my mirror neurons light up and they say, Sean, you're yawning. But I'm not yawning, that person is. What we discovered is this, if you have 15 strangers, this study is incredible, and you can do this yourself, 15 strangers all waiting for a plane, they don't even know they're part of an experiment yet, and you introduce a research confederate, that's an undercover researcher, to stand in the middle of the 15 people within a five meter radius and just begin to bounce nervously in place. Tap his foot impatiently on the ground and look at his watch repeatedly with a frown on his face. Within two minutes of waiting for that plane, depending on the study, between seven to 12 of the 15 individuals will unconsciously start bouncing nervously in place and or tapping their foot on the ground and or looking at their watch four times in a two minute span of time. If you don't believe me, this is one of the experiments you can try out yourself the next time you're getting on a plane. If you wanna spread stress and negativity to the people on your plane. Which is why I do this at a different gate. But the reason I love this experiment I love this experiment because it shows us, look around at this room. This room is clearly connected, but there's no wires connecting any of you. The reason is these mirror neurons change what it means to be human. It turns out we're not wired for connection. We are wirelessly connected through a mirror neuron network. Not only do smiles and yawns spread, it turns out negativity, stress, and uncertainty, we can pick up like secondhand smoke. You don't even have to be the one doing it to experience the negative health effects. As soon as I tell people that, they're like, here are the people I'm cutting out of my life. I'm not gonna talk to that person anymore. I'm not gonna go to lunch with that person. I'm defriending them. I'm not even gonna look at that person. 
but I think there's a stronger way. I think there's sometimes we need to do that, but here's why this research is so powerful. What we found is this mirror neuron goes both directions, right? So what we found is if we can find some way of strengthening ourselves, building up our resiliency against negativity, stress, and uncertainty, then a single positive change you make to your life can actually ripple back out to those other people. We can create a positive ripple effect outwards with a single behavioral change, and that's what we found. We, last year, we transformed an entire series of hospitals in New Orleans post-Katrina just using smiles within the hallways. Not only did their profit levels go up, but patients started liking coming there, and their patient satisfaction rate skyrocketed. Single positive change. What I'd like to do is talk about how this room can change all the people who are not in this room right now. Which is where I get excited. There are thousands of people here in this room, which means the multiple effect coming out of this event could be incredible if we bring this research to life. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. So I got into this research after that bunk bed when I got into Harvard. I applied to Harvard on a dare. I grew up in a small town. Well, I grew up in Waco, Texas. Is anyone from Waco? I loved Waco. I was going to spend the rest of my life there. When it came time for college, because of debts and other things, my family had no money for college, which was fine because I was going to go to the Naval Academy, which would be free, or to Baylor because my dad would have been free. I applied to Harvard just so I could tell my kids someday, oh yeah, I'd applied. But I wasn't valedictorian in my high school. I wasn't, I didn't get perfect SAT scores. I was a volunteer firefighter in Waco, and that got me in. And when I arrived on campus, I remember sitting there in classrooms with students that were much smarter than me or better academically prepared than me. And I remember thinking, I could feel bad about myself, but this is incredible. I'm surrounded by all these incredible people. This is an amazing opportunity. I looked around, there other students that saw their education that way. But I then spent the next eight years of my life after graduating as I lived in the dorms with the freshmen. Harvard invited me to, I wasn't that guy who just stays in the freshman dorms for eight extra years. But my mom was very proud. But what we found was, I watched these students who had a success in their life. All of us have had success in our life. And they got into the school that they wanted to go to, which should have made them happy. But two weeks later, their brains were not focused on the privilege of being there, nor even on their philosophy or physics. Their brain was focused on the competition, the workload, the stresses, hassles, complaints. What we found is this place that should have been happy, four out of five of those individuals report experiencing work debilitating depression. And 10% of them contemplated suicide over the previous year. This is heartbreaking and not about Harvard. This is about every human brain in the world and the way that we get happiness and success wrong. See, when my friends from Waco would come to visit me, they'd walk into the, this is the freshman dining hall with its vaulted wooden ceilings and Tiffany stained glass. They'd walk in there and they'd say, it looks like something out of Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter which it does. This is Hogwarts from the movie Harry Potter. With Ron and Harry in the corner. How many people have seen Harry Potter? And this is Harvard. And they see this and they say, why would you waste time studying happiness at Harvard? Why aren't you in the slums of Venezuela? Why aren't you in impoverished schools in Africa? Why aren't you in a children's cancer ward in Boston? Since then, I've researched in all of those places. Earlier this year, I was out at St. Jude Children's Hospital trying to find out trying to find out why it is that four-year-olds with terminal cancer are more likely to tell their parents everything's gonna be okay than the reverse. What is it about joy that children seem to get that we want to tap back into? But their question is the one I want to share with you. Their question is this, why waste time studying happiness at Harvard? Because seriously, what does a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? Look at their opportunities, their resources, the wealth. Everyone in this room and everyone I met worldwide has a reason and a valid reason why they cannot be happy. But here's what we found. What we found is if we can change the way that we look at the world, it turns out only 10% of our long-term levels of happiness is predicted based upon the externals in our world. 90% of our long-term levels of happiness is not about what's going on in your external world. It's about how your brain processes it. And that's the part we can change. So here's what we found. What we found is this. Um, we found the human brain, first of all, when we started looking at it, we found that 
only 25% of job success is predicted based upon intelligence. 75% of it is based upon three other predictors. Those other predictors are this, your optimism, your social connection, which is clear this group needs no help with. <laughs> It's been incredible watching you walk around Tampa and lighting this place up with your green. It's been amazing. And the last one is perceiving stress as a challenge instead of as a threat. 75% of our long-term successes are based upon those three factors, which means we've got happiness actually wrong. What we found is when we looked at happiness, we found that individuals, if you take them from negative to positive, their sales increased by 37% on average. At MetLife, the top 10% of optimists were outselling the other 90% by another 90%, which is crazy. We found that you're three times more creative, 31% more productive. I'd go through this list, but honestly, it's all of them. Every single business and educational outcome improves significantly when the human brain is positive first. This is where I think this gets exciting. Because here's what we found. I see this in my own life, and I'm wondering if you see this in your life too. We think, we think to ourselves, if I can just work harder right now, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. That undergirds our parenting styles, our managing styles, what we've been taught over and over again. That formula is scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. And it's the reason that I wrote the book. The reason is this. Every time we have a success, our brain changes the goalpost of what success looks like. You got okay grades in school? Don't get excited, you have to get into a better school. You get a job, don't get excited, you need a better job. You hit, you hit some amazing sales here, don't get excited because we need to raise it for the next year. And we want to in keep increasing our sales. We want to keep seeing what the human brain is capable of. The problem is, is if we put happiness on the opposite side of success, the brain never gets there. <clears throat> but more importantly, here's what we found. Because of all this research, meta-analyses of over 300,000 people worldwide, what we know is this, the human brain works best at positive. The formula is backwards. If we flip the formula, if we find some way in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of stress, in the midst of our work, in the midst of your kids taking tests, if in the midst of that we raise your levels of happiness significantly, then your success rates rise dramatically over what they would have been otherwise. If we want to see what the human brain is capable of above average, we have to see what it's like when it's actually positive. In order to do that, we need to figure out how can we change. And what I'd like to talk about is I've been looking over the past couple years, what are things you could do that have these qualities? A habit that takes less than two minutes a day that would change your levels of happiness significantly for more than six months. Around day 28 or 29, it has to rewire the neural pathways in your brain. It has to affect your business outcomes, and it needs to be able to work with genes, that, genes of, for people who have genes that are negative. We found four of them, and the fifth one just takes more than two minutes. That's what I wanted to share with you right now. What we found is, these are the five we found. The first one is this. We found that, and many of you I have already heard doing this. In fact, we, many of you already took on this challenge. We had people for 21 days in a row Write down three new things that they're grateful for every day for 21 days in a row. It takes 45 seconds a day. We found if you take 84-year-old men and have them do this gratitude exercise and they have genes for pessimism, six months later, actually three weeks later, they're significantly happier. Their optimism moved from low levels of pessimism to low levels of optimism, which is crazy. That means you can change the human brain at any point with 45 seconds. Six months later, if these gentlemen were still alive, they found that those individuals actually had significantly higher levels of optimism. Not by changing the rest of the 24 hours, but by taking 45 seconds a day to think of three new things that they're grateful for, and that's the key. It doesn't matter what you're grateful for, it matters that your brain is scanning for more than one thing, and it's a constant basis, because it turns out your brain gets stuck. The second one we found, by the way, at day 28 or 29, we can watch the neural pathways in your brain change. Your brain becomes an expert, slowly but surely becoming an optimist. We have not found a human being worldwide yet that is not capable of change with this experiment. Incredible. The second one is the doubler. I've been working with the National MS Society this year. One of the things we found is if you take two minutes a day, 
two minutes a day, and every day, think about one meaningful experience you've had over the past 24 hours. Any meaningful experience. And right at this event, you've had many. Just pick one. Don't try and journal about a lot, but for two minutes a day, just write down in a blank Word document, or into a workbook, or into like a moleskin, just write down every detail you can remember about that meaningful experience. When you do that, if you look at your hand in front of your face, area 17 of your visual cortex lights up. But if you close your eyes and think about your hand in front of your face, the same part of your brain lights up. We can't tell much difference between visualization and actual experience. Why this is exciting is if you journal your most meaningful experience that you've had here, you just doubled it for your brain. Do it for 21 days in a row, your brain connects the dots, and you now realize you have this band of patent, uh, meaning running throughout your life. With the National MS Society, we took individuals, everyone in this room has reasons why they couldn't be happy, if you're not feeling happy. We took individuals that have those, but also have a chronic neuromuscular pain, so when they wake up in the morning, they have great amount of fatigue and sometimes pain as well. We asked them, is happiness still a choice for you? 1,400 people immediately replied back, yes it is, we want to be part of a study. So what we did is we had them read through the happiness advantage, we gave five of them a happiness coach, and filmed them with an Emmy award winning producer who has MS herself to show those stories back to the communities. And what we found is this, if you journal like this for six months in a row, six weeks in a row, six months later, they can drop your pain medication with a chronic neuromuscular pain disease by 50%. These sound like tips or tricks, but these are the building blocks of how the human brain moves above where you started when you came here to Tampa. The third one is exercise, which I've already heard from one of the speakers, already covered that. 15 minutes of cardio activity is the equivalent of taking an antidepressant, but has 30% less relapse over the next two years, because exercise is a starter drug. When you exercise, you start believing your behavior matters, so you start eating healthier. You start making better choices, you start doing the other habits, and as a result of that, you create a cascade of success. The fourth one is meditation. For two minutes a day, we had people at Google take their hands off of their keyboard and watch their breath go in and out. That's it. We had them do one activity, watch your breath go in and out. Our brains are trying to multitask all the time, but we had you do one activity. Just watch your breath go in and out, and here's what we found. When individuals did this, not only did it increase their accuracy rates in their work, but their levels of happiness skyrocketed. Around day 21, they were able to take their entire brain and shine it down like a laser on their work, and their stress levels dropped. Amazing, two minutes of meditation. And that's not Christian or Buddhist. I got into this research studying at the Divinity School, and you'll see how this list are things that all these major religions have been teaching us, and science is just catching up now. The fifth one is, ran, uh, is conscious acts of kindness. This is my favorite, and I hope you'll pick this one out of the five to do. For 21 days in a row, I would love it if every person in, the, in this room picked one person new each day who's in your social support network, family member, friend, a coach, a teacher, somebody on your team, whoever it is. And what I'd love for you to do is for 21 days in a row, write to a different person for two minutes a day, praising them or thanking, some, uh, thanking them in an email. What we found is when you do this, if you do it for three days in a row, you become addicted. You actually, if we look at a brain scan, it looks like you're on cocaine while you're doing this experiment, which is incredible. And what we found is, the reason you get addicted to it, by the way, is as you write to these people, thanking them or praising them for something, your brain, for the rest of the day, is gonna think about how amazing you were for sending that email. <laughs> I wrote to a high school English teacher and said, you're the reason I fell in love with reading. You're the reason I wrote my book. Thank you for changing my life. It took me 45 seconds, took me longer to find her email address online. If you do this for 21 days in a row, of course you're making other people happier, but I want to talk about you for a second because these habits start with us. What we found is this, 21 days later, you increased your brain's perception of social support. You have 21 people in your social support network, and what we found is, when you have that, it's the greatest predictor of long-term levels of happiness we have, and it predicts your longevity. Your social support networks that you've been creating, they're as predictive of your longevity is high blood pressure, obesity, and smoking. We know how powerful the negative is, we forget about the positive. Here's what I'd love for you to do. I would love to do an experiment with this room. I would love for you to pick one of these habits and try it out for the next 21 days in a row. Test to see if scientifically happiness is a choice, and if happiness spreads, and if happiness is an advantage. And what we found is when you do this, 
We can literally rewire the human brain to not only become more positive, but to ripple it out to other people and it raises every business and educational and even health outcomes at the same time, which is incredible. But the question is, how do we do that? How do we move from the information you've been hearing at this conference to, to transformation? Because if we hear so many good ideas, what part are we actually gonna do? First of all, I'd love to see right now, only pick one of these five to try out, but pick one of these right now, and I just wanna see what the response is. Who's, for the next 21 days in a row, is gonna do the three gratitudes? Raise your hand. How many people are gonna do the doubler? How many people are gonna do the 15 minutes of fun exercise? How many people are gonna do the meditation? That group, because it's gonna be, they have to be quiet. The fifth one is conscious acts of kindness. Who's gonna do that one? Look at this group, if they don't send you an email, you are not in their top 21. <laughs> or they're not doing it, so you need to yell at them. But here's what we found. I heard a sleep researcher one time say, if you sleep eight to nine hours a night, you will live longer. I went to bathroom, I was like, that's amazing, you must sleep 20 hours a night? And he said, Sean, I'm a sleep researcher. I stay awake all night watching people sleep. I'm not sleeping, I sleep four to five hours a night and take a half an hour nap in the middle of the day. We can, we joke, we joke, joked about it afterwards, he looked 10 years older than he actually was. He was walking living proof that he was brilliant. We can know these things, but not do them. What I'd love to encourage you to do is to encourage each other to try them out. What I would love is before you go to sleep tonight, you try just one of these things. Maybe on the break, as soon as we're finished here, just write a two-minute email or a text or a Facebook message to someone in your social support network. Or make it just slightly easier to do. In my book, there's something called the 20-second uh, rule, which we found that if you make habit three to 20 seconds easier to do, your likelihood of doing it rises dramatically. So pack an exercise bag if you need to. Or make sure that when you go to sleep at night, you've got a journal sitting right next to you. Or you do your three gratitudes while you're brushing your teeth. Whatever you can do to make this happen. Because all this research comes down to three things. It comes down to that happiness is a choice, happiness is an advantage, and happiness spreads. We've been trying to do all of this together. Part, actually, part of what we were just doing before I came to this event, it was we were sprinting to be able to get this, uh, uh, I, I've got my book, The Happiness Advantage, but I've been working with Success um, Magazine to be able to create this product called, it's, it's called the, the Happiness Kit, and what it does is it gives you a workbook as well as a happiness uh, books so you can go through it and they even gave us these these cool little bands that say I'm grateful and what it's attempting to do is allow us to go deeper because what I would like is this not to be a one-shot event I don't want this to be a talk and for you to say oh that was interesting this happiness research is great I want you to actually do it so here's your homework uh, I can't help but be a teacher but here's your homework first I'd like you to do this habit for 21 days in a row and pick somebody to do it with the second is I have a TED Talk, which is a free 10-minute oh, yeah. long talk nice. online called The Happy Secret to Better Work. This is a 10-minute summary of this. So if there are people that are not here that you care about, that you want to do this habit with, watch the video with them and then talk about how you can actually start to get this research infused into our lives and to creep that happiness movement. And finally, what I'd love for you to do is to inspire other people around you to do this as well. Find a group of people do you think could benefit from this? And start teaching them about this research. And what we found is if we can bring this research to life, what we found is we can take this research that only seven people know about, six people and one very proud mom, and we can turn it into something that's life-giving, that'll tip this world away from its negativity and stress, to a world that believes, like you do, that our behavior matters, that there are things in our present that we're grateful for, and that there's meaning embedded in our lives that we can ripple out to other people. And all it takes is choosing it first. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this research with you. And now the great work begins.